something that interferes with simply believing. And so, Lord, we're grateful uh, for the children of our fellowship to take this time to do this. But more than having fun here, Lord, and, and being recorded by all of the parents, Lord, I just pray that this message resonates with them. It's something they'll never forget throughout the rest of their lives. Because, Lord, as we age and get older and uh, the cares and concerns of this life have a tendency to sort of push the meaning and the significance of what it is that these kids just did. And now, fathers, we turn our attention to your word. We just pray, as we always pray, that you would speak to our hearts. Teach us things that uh, we don't know. Challenge us and uh, uh, let us see you um, from the true perspective, and that is of the Scripture itself. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. All right. So, now we've been moving through, uh, going through the... Uh, the whole concept of Christmas and stuff, but from a biblical perspective. Now, we talked a little bit about last week because we have, what we recognize and what we understand today as Christmas, we need to understand that the traditions that we observe, these things have only been around for some, some of them, literally for a couple of hundred years. And so we need to really then maybe ask ourselves, well, what was the perspective of the world that, uh, that was before that time, in particular of those people um, of Jesus' day that would have been, uh, you know, would have been right there and engaged in everything that was happening. Because a lot of times when we read in, in the Scripture, we see something and we assume that, it, that there's uh, something else that's made and, and somebody teaches that perspective and this is what becomes traditions. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. But the reality of it is we need to understand this stuff from God's perspective. So we took the time last week to look at, <clears throat> of all of the things, this uh, celebration that most of us, at least I hope until last, sat, uh, last Sunday, uh, were unaware of, but this uh, celebration that the Jews have every year that falls in the same time frame as Christmas. And of course, that's Hanukkah. And we talked about how last week, why that is so significant. It is not one of the appointed times of God, the feasts, as our Bibles tell us, but literally the word means these are appointed or fixed times that God established. We're going to look at them here in just a minute. Um, but it, that it was a very significant period of time because what, if, what had happened, this was when this uh, false proclaimer that, uh, that announced himself as being God, uh, the ruler of the, uh, the Greek empire uh, in those days, about 200 years before Jesus, and his name was Antiochus Epiphanes. And this guy actually believed that he was God in the flesh. As I said, most pharaohs and all of the Caesars thought that as well. It's nothing new. Um, but he pronounced himself, and because he was going to now be the God in Jerusalem and the God of Israel was there, we know the story, he, uh, he desecrates the temple, he sets up a statue of Zeus and, uh, and, and sets it up for a specific day, the, the 25th day of the month of Kislev, which we get our December from, and, uh, and this is supposed to be Zeus's birthday, and so he sets up this idol worship in the temple and defiles the temple. He, he pours oil as he sacrifices a pig, the, the, the oil and stuff and the dirty water that's uh, left over, he dumps that onto the, uh, the scriptures that had been written that the people had trusted in most of their lives as they learned as Jews. And so uh, this created a huge problem and a big resistance uh, that came and, and the Jews rose up against this. And actually, three and a half years after he had done this, they expelled this guy and uh, uh, got control of Jerusalem again until the Romans would come in. And this, of course, is the period that we call the Maccabees. That's when all of this was happening. And we talked about how last week that uh, the whole point of that is, is having been desecrated or having desecrated the temple, that what these guys did is they went in there and they cleansed it and they did all of the stuff. Um, and then they lit the menorah, uh, which was supposed to burn for eight days, but they did not have en enough oil. Now, this is tradition. Um, they only had enough oil, because remember in those days they dumped oil into their lamps uh, for one day, but uh, miraculously it lasted for eight days, and that's where we get the uh, Hanukkah menorah from, 
which is different than the standard menorah of seven. There's eight branches, four on each side, with the shamash, which is the center one, and you'd light that you know, you light the shamash every day in, in the evening, and then you would write what, uh, the one candle, and you would do that for each consecutive day all the way through until all of the uh, nine candles were lit. And so that was the period of Hanukkah. And the reason that all this is significant is because not only was it this dedication back to God and this cleansing, but it was a reminder of God's truth, how it eliminates, how the light comes in and exposes the lie of those who would proclaim themselves to be God. Now, we said that Antiochus Epiphanes is, which by the way, we get our word epiphany from, um, but we that, that he was sort of a picture of one who's coming because make no mistake about it, there is someone in this world out there who very shortly will do this again, uh, will once again proclaim himself to be God and the vast majority of the world will bow down to this. This is where it's all headed. So that's what was going on. But in Jesus' day, some 200 years later, we read there uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, John's Gospel in the 10th chapter that Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch uh, for the Feast of Dedication. Hanukkah means dedication. That's what it means. So what our English is telling us is on the Feast of Hanukkah. He was walking there, and it was at that point that he uh, explained exactly who he was. So as he's walking there, he knew, and the religious leaders of his day knew exactly what was going on, um, that this guy is doing exactly what uh, Antiochus had done, and so we're going to go find out who he, what he's really up to. And so they send uh, their religious leaders up to him with the high priest, and they said, listen, if you're the Messiah, just tell us plainly. We know the story. We don't need to get all back into it. Jesus said, I already told you. I already showed you. You know exactly who I am. And at this, of course, he's proclaiming himself to be God. And in that same chapter is where he said, I and the Father are one, right? And so... Uh, so this created a big stir. These guys were not going to allow another imposter, from their perspective, once again to claim to be God. And we read that they took up stones to kill him. And of course, he, he got away because it wasn't his time. So that's what Hanukkah is about. Now, we also took the time to look at the fact that if you rewind the tape 30 years, that it would have been at that precise time when what we saw in the first part of the play here, when Gabriel visits both Mary and uh, Joseph, that uh, she would have conceived during Hanukkah. And we know that because John, uh, John the Baptist's Mom Elizabeth was pregnant with him six months, and I won't go into all the details. We did that last week. So in essence, Jesus was not born on, on Hanukkah. He's conceived. He's born nine months later. Nine months later puts us at tabernacles. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Now, tabernacles literally means, uh, the, the word is, is, what it means is, and, and, and how they would pronounce it, the Jews would pronounce it, is Sukkot. Okay, so it means, it's plural, notice it's tabernacles. And what it means is that God dwells with us. Now, this was established as one of God's appointed times. Way back there in Leviticus chapter 23, as God is explaining to Moses what, what it's going to mean for his people to be just that, his people. And so he gives them his appointed times, okay? And we looked at those, and we saw that, whoops, we went out here, I lost my screen. Uh, let me go one more time. There it is, God's appointed times, there it is. So this is what we looked at. Now remember, it's vitally important because we live in a day, and really for the last couple of centuries, that everybody says, well, uh, you know, New Testament pastors and all this stuff. Well, we really don't need to understand all these feasts of Israel because after all, they're feasts of Israel, right? So we don't need to spend any time with them. The problem with that is they are not feasts of Israel. They're not feasts of Moses. God said, Leviticus 23, these are my holy days, my appointed times, my affixed times. They're mine. They're not the Jews. They're not Moses's. They're not the churches. They're not any religion or denomination. It clearly says there, these are mine. And since they're God's, 
regardless of what Israel does with them or what Moses did with them, we need to understand what they are. So those appointed times, as God lays them out for him, for them, he gives them seven fixed times. Now, we've talked about this before, so I don't want to belabor the point. Why is there seven? Because seven is the number of completion, not perfection. Seven completes. In seven days, the Lord complete, uh, uh, created the heavens and the earth. So it's the idea of completion. So there are seven fixed times of God which complete what God is doing. Had we understood this from the beginning, we would have understood that in those seven fixed times that everything God would do throughout history, because remember he said, these are not just my feasts, I want them to be remembered every single year. And that's why we see them every year and throughout the rest of time. But what did they tell us? They tell us everything. When we understand God's appointed times, we will understand that he has shown us the roadmap of all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he has yet to do. They're all there. That's why it gives us a complete picture. So we've looked at these in the past. We're really focusing now on what, what we call um, the fall feasts. But remember that it starts off in the first month. Secondly, remember God does not go by the name of months. That's a human creation. For God, it's the 10th day of the first month. It's the 14th day of the first month. That's all it is. Nisan, for us, March or April, it all comes from our understanding of those things. But from a biblical perspective, it's all about the month. So in the first month, we looked at this, and I forgot to change the slide again. You'd think I'd figure this out. I remember I showed you this. That, that should say spring, first month, March, and April. Now remember, the first month, we go by a sun calendar, solar. God established time based on the moon. It's off of a lunar calendar. That's why there's always this weird difference that goes on. But if we understand it from the Bible as the first month, then we understand that it's our month. It falls between mid-March and mid-April, okay? And that's where, uh, uh, where uh, actually, I, I got this right. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking um, uh, Passover. Sorry about that. Passover is in the spring, okay? And we saw that when Jesus came, that he was crucified on Passover as the Passover lamb on the exact day. This is why God wanted Moses to record this. This is what I'm going to do. You write this down and it's going to happen. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. He was put in the ground the next day for unleavened bread, and he rose again on the third of the feasts that fall in the first month, which was called first fruits. And first fruits is always a Sunday, okay? Always, which is why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus is our first fruits, okay? He's the first with the, the idea of the resurrection. So Jesus was crucified on Passover, he was buried on leavened bread, and he rose again on first fruits, completely, exactly to the day, fulfilling all that God had said this this is what's going to happen as I fix these times, and I want you to remember. And they were to look forward to the coming of Messiah. We look back as Messiah having already been here. Okay? So that's what happened in the spring. Now in the summer, here we are, now I caught up, um, 50 days later, God tells them to count it off, 50 days later, God has them celebrate what is called um, uh, Gosh, I've got this all messed up. Uh, no, that's right. What? I'm, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. This is really strange in case you're wondering, sitting here looking down like this. Um, but it's called Shavuot because it's the Feast of Weeks. There were seven weeks to be counted. So 49 days. And then on the 50th day was what was called Pentecost. And Pentecost is the Greek equivalent because Penta is 50. 
So 50 days after the resurrection, Jesus tells the apostles he was here for 10 days after his resurrection, and then he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, right? So 50 days later, he called, uh, the, the Holy Spirit comes down uh, on his people, and of course, Peter preaches his sermon. Now, when we come to the fall, which is where we find ourselves now, we saw that in the seventh month, our September to October, but in the seventh month was called trumpets and Yom Teruah, so day, and Teruah is rejoicing. But it's literally the, the day of sounding, and that's where trumpets comes in. This became known as Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which literally means head of the year, okay? And then 10 days after that, they were to celebrate the Day of Atonement, which is uh, Yom Kippur, day, Yom, and Kippur is atonement or to cover, okay? And so that's what they did. And then we looked at uh, one that came before this, and we're going to see this in just a second. This is in the fall month, uh, the seventh month of September, October, um, and then last week we looked at this, and the reason I'm doing that is because if you go from this and you count nine months back around, you come to none other than, and by the way, that's winter, that's the December, you come to none other than tabernacles. So what we're going to see is that Jesus was not born on December 25th. He just wasn't. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, there's been debate over this within the last couple of centuries, but remember, prior to this, that didn't exist. Everybody understood this, and we're going to see why. So when we, when we take a look at this and we understand this, it's going to make all the sense in the world, okay? Now, does that mean we shouldn't celebrate December 25th? No. I'm getting ready to celebrate Christmas, December the 25th. I'm okay with that, even if I don't think it's correct. Nevertheless, we're recognizing that as the day when our God took on human flesh and entered into our world. I've got no problem with that. So we're not going to like destroy it or get rid of it. But let's clarify our understanding. And you're going to see why this plays out. Now, for those of you that don't know, I mentioned last week, but last Friday, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that the Tabernacles, we, we looked at this back when we looked at it the last time, started this year on the 2nd, uh, at sundown, and it went for seven days until sundown on the 9th of October. So we're in December. So we'd already looked at this before when we were in September. So how do we know? How do we know, and, and what are you using to base this on, Rick? I mean, after all, everybody's gone along with this. Well, frankly, they haven't gone along with it. There's major debate uh, uh, amongst quote-unquote, biblical scholars uh, over the date of Jesus' birth. Because everybody knows, and they know, believe me, he wasn't born in December. Okay, He just wasn't. Shepherds wouldn't have been in the field then. In fact, in the Mishnah, it says during the winter months, which of course December falls in, that the sheep were put into a sheepfold to kept out of the weather. And these are the sheep that are to be used at the temple. So we know that the sheep weren't out in December. They're not. They never have been. So that's one of the reasons, and there's a multitude of others. But we're not worried about what everybody thinks. Let's see what God's Word has to say. And I believe, and as you I hope will see this morning, that it very clearly tells us in John's, the, uh, John's Gospel in the first chapter. So let's read this through, and you'll understand we're going to take it apart here and break it down a little bit more. Now, very familiar passage for many of us, in particular the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, in fact, God. Okay, it doesn't say He was a God. It says He was God. So it's equating whoever the Word is, is being equated with God. Okay? Now, in the Greek, the word word there is the Greek word logos. Okay? That's what we get our term logic comes from this. It means reason. It means understanding, okay? And the Greek word for God is theos. We get theology, right? We, that's, these are the words that we get from this. In the Greek, this is actually reversed. It's changed in the English because of the way the English language was written. But literally in the Greek, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
But the last phrase does not say the word was God. It says theos in holagas. God was the word. Okay? Now that's very important to understand because there's no confusing this. This is why the original languages are so important to our understanding. It wasn't that the word was God. It's that God was the word. He is the logic. He is reason. He is all of those things. How do we know that? Look at the rest of the passage. And he, that is the word in verse 2, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing, uh, was nothing, nothing was made that was made. So the word, okay, is the one that God created through. The second part of the Godhead, the Son. Verse 4 now, in him was life. He is the source of life. So who breathed into Adam's nostrils after God formed Adam from the dust of the ground? Remember, that's not his creation. That's forming. It was, the creation of Adam was when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Who is it that breathed into Adam's nostrils? Jesus. What we call Jesus. The, person, the second part of the Godhead. The Word. The Word himself. I mean, this is really significant. So when John chapter 1 and just the first, first four verses, we're starting to already see that this is what John is explaining to us. He's telling us all this. Because in what these first four verses are telling us, he's going to conclude when we get to verse 14, that in fact, God came and dwelt with us. In other words, he tabernacled with us. Okay? So now let's take a look at the next verses. Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness. We're going to see that as John develops this, he never separates life from light, nor light from life. So it isn't light like we have glaring through here that needs electricity. Clearly, the light that's being described here is something beyond what we understand. So the concept of light in the scripture is the, is, is, implies illumination, a clarity and understanding that is hidden away unless it's illuminated. So it's speaking of that type of a light. It's very different than most people think because we see Jesus, you know, some people, you know, like walking around like he's a light bulb or something. That's not what's being described here. And that light, God's illumination. What is he illuminating? Truth. Because when Jesus was here, he would, what, when he came into this world, and this is what his entire ministry was about, was to reveal, to illuminate, to explain, to expose all that had been written by the law and the prophets. Our Wednesday crew has been talking about this, which is exactly what he did with the two guys on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. He went back to Moses and he went to the prophets to explain all things that had been written about him. He explained it from what? The Old Testament. There was no New Testament. So Jesus used the Old Testament to explain Everything those guys needed to know, because clearly they didn't get it. But we're not supposed to preach Jesus from the Old Testament. Well, why not? The first believers did for a couple of centuries. Because even after these guys, John, Paul, Peter, all of them, after they wrote their writings, they just simply wrote something and sent it on to the churches. Do you know how long it would take to do that by hand and get that all over the world? Because we have this tendency to think, well, the New Testament was written basically by the end of the first century, and therefore everybody had Bibles. No, 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 no. Just because it had been written by these guys didn't mean it was widely circulated. Remember, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have these things. It was, you write this down. Can you imagine writing down the gospel of Matthew word for word? Do you know how long that would take? So it was a couple of centuries. So what, was, what were the teaching? What were they using? They were using the Old Testament because it had been recorded. 
That's what they were teaching from. But we're told today we shouldn't use the Old Testament because, well, I don't know, it's old. No, it's not. It's the foundation of our understanding of the new. So, so this, the, 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 this is just crazy. So the illumination, the concept of light, is illuminating, making known, understanding what God had already said in Moses and the prophets, helping them to see it. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Don't think that I came to set aside Torah. I did not. I came to explain it. Your English says fulfill, but we all know now that's wrong. That's not what he said, because that means to fulfill means there's something ended. That's not what he said. He said, I didn't come to set it aside, speaking of the Old Testament. I came to explain it. The light shines in the darkness. He came to explain the truth. It's precisely what Jesus himself taught us. Why do we not connect the dots in these things? It's unbelievable. So the light shines in the darkness, but watch what happens. But the darkness did not comprehend it. It didn't understand. What is the darkness? It's the world. Now it doesn't take you know, a, a historian to look at human history and see that it's very, very dark. Has there ever been a time in the history of man that somebody isn't trying to rule over somebody else? and subjugating whoever would reject them, and promoting their own gods. This world, from Adam and Eve on, has been very, very dark. But the light came in. And of course, it's speaking of who he is. And he himself would say also in John, in the Gospel of John in the 8th chapter, I am the light the illumination, the exposition of truth. I am the light of what? The world. So the darkness did not comprehend it. He came in here, but we didn't get it. Do you know why we didn't get it? And still many don't. Because we had created our own systems, which we now call religion. Remember, Jesus didn't have a religious bone in his body. He was never religious. Neither were the apostles. Never it was a religion that, could, that said, we don't want him, let's get rid of him, because he's teaching not our religion, but relationship. That God wants a relationship with his people, with the world who is in darkness. In fact, in Malachi, we read about that, that, that the light has come into the darkness, right? The people have seen a great light, well, what light are they seeing? They're seeing the truth as it, as it is revealed in the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The darkness did not comprehend it. That's why verse 6 was necessary. There was a man sent from God. Because had these people understood their Old Testament, their scriptures, they didn't call it Old Testament, had they understood this, they would have understood the ministry of John. Because he came to prepare the way, that is to clear and to straighten the way for the one who was to follow. John was a messenger for Messiah. Okay? That's what this John, that's not John the one writing the gospel, that's John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. So John, writing his gospel, is telling us about John the Baptist. They're two completely different guys. John was a very popular name in those days. Okay, It still is. Of course, I don't know. Now when people name their kids, they've got all these weird names, right? Half of you, half of them, you get all tongue-tied to say, but because there's, we get away from, you know, the old John, Larry, you know, stuff like that has gone out the window. Now there's all these other names. Nothing wrong with that, but that, John was a very common name. So now we look in verse 7. Now there's an explanation of this. This man came for a witness. He came to explain who the light was. Look at the rest of the verse. This man, John the Baptist, came for a witness to bear witness of the light 
So John came to tell everybody, after me, one is coming who will teach us all that we need to know about what God has said in Moses and the prophets. Remember Luke 24 and the guys on the road to Emmaus, right? It's amazing. So he came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him, that's the light, might believe. Because prior to his entering into this dark world, people didn't know what to believe. Because everybody, as I've already said, had their own God, had their own religion, had their own understanding of the stuff, and they would war with one another over these guys. The Assyrians, and there's multitude others, but the Assyrians had Molech. They had, they had Ashtoreth, the Babylonians. Well, they had Baal. They had, you know, all of these other gods. The Romans, they had Zeus. You know, the Greeks, they, they, everybody had their gods and they had their particular religious system. Remember what Antiochus Epiphanes did? He wanted to get rid of the God of Israel and the worship of that God and establish belief in him as the God of his religion. That's why he desecrated the temple. Temple. He was trying to get rid of the Jewish religion. That was the point. It was, a, it was a conflict in that. And the one that we talked about that's going to come in, into our world at some time in the future, we read that he's going to do exactly the same thing, isn't he? He's not going to allow any religion other than his. And he will ultimately demand to be, demand on pain of death, to be worshipped as God, not a God. I am God, he's going to say. That's just exactly what Epiphanes said. You see, we could just go on and on. It's all there for us. So the, the, the world, they didn't know what to believe. Because it seemed like, well, when the Babylonians were in control, their gods are the stronger gods. Therefore, their religion seems to be supreme. Well, that worked out until the Persians showed up. And then all of a sudden, well, the Babylonian god isn't as strong as the gods of the Persians because now the Persians are ruling. And of course, that was better and that was okay until Alexander the Great comes in with the Greeks and brings in what we call Greek mythology. And now all of a sudden, there's a pantheon of gods. Well, the Greek gods must be stronger. And of course, the Romans were right along a part of that. Do you see? It just goes on and on and on. This is world history, you guys. All the way back. What about the Egyptians? What about the Sumerians? What about the Hittites? We could just go on and on. It was always the same. These people wanted to rule the world, what they understood as the world, and force the world to believe what they believe and to subjugate these people because those particular empires had, had uh, overcome the others and therefore their gods reigned superior. We even see this in the Old Testament, which we talked again on our Wednesday night. When Moses is at the burning bush, and God says, I want you to go tell them that the God of Israel is sending you. And Moses said, well, wait a minute, I'll go and tell them, but who am I supposed to tell them you are? We're in Egypt. Are you the God of the Nile? Are you the God of the sun? Are you the God of the dirt or of the frogs or of the flies? Which God do I tell them sent me? Which is why God gives him that incredible name. Eyeh, asher, eyeh. I am that I am. I am the, the, the uh, self-existent one. All the gods of Egypt can't say that. And I'm going to prove it to you because I'm going to beat their gods down. We're going to call them plagues, but they were judgments on the gods of Egypt, the ten plagues of Egypt. That's what they were. That's why God did that. The last was on Pharaoh himself because he claimed as God he had power over life and death. And God said, no. How about Nair? <laughs> Right? So that's why this is all significant. This is the world, you guys. We live in today that people will just make all kinds of things to, to move God out of the way and create all of these other things to get him out of the way. But it's through Jesus that all might believe to receive, to take hold of what God has promised that he would do as revealed in his appointed times. That someone would come and die 
in our place that he would bury, but death wouldn't keep him. He would rise again, and then he would give us his power 50 days later, and then the rest is yet to be fulfilled because these fall feasts are, haven't been fulfilled yet by Jesus. They will when he comes back. So we're looking forward to him coming back to fulfill them. So all men through him might believe. He, that is John the Baptist, was not that light. That was not his role, nor was it his responsibility, and certainly wasn't his purpose. He came to point everybody to the light, and that's what he's saying here. He, John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That the true light, that is, of course, the word in our context, but we all know who it is now, that that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So everyone has access to understanding truth. Notice that there's no requirement for adherence to any denomination to a belief in any particular theology. Because there's a multitude out there, all claiming to be right. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? It's just, it's just incredible. The only thing that's right is God's word. But every man, if any man that wants to believe he's who he is, he will give you the truth that you need to know. It's available to any. What does it take to get it? Obedience? restraint, a big list of what you can do and what you can't do, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. No, that's religion. A specific set of clothes that you're to wear, right? A specific set of songs that you're to sing. A specific set of prayers that you're to pray. Does it say that anywhere in the passage? No. Do you want to understand Believe in the light that God sent to give you understanding. If you believe in Rick to help you to understand, you're a nut job. You need serious help. I'll see if Danielle can get you one of those sheep costumes as well, because you, like me, should be going around going, bah, bah, right? If you listen to me and believe what I say for the sake of it being me, then you're nuts. It's as simple as that. I'm teaching you God's word, not my opinions. This is the way that it is. And that's what we all should do. And make no mistake about it, that's exactly what Paul says is going to happen to those that teach the Word of God. Our standard is in some theological seminary. Our standard is God's Word. And that's what we'll be judged by. How faithful were, you, or were we to communicate His Word without letting our bias or our prejudice get in the way? Because we always do, Right? How do you think we can have so many different versions of Baptists? So many versions of Methodists? So many versions of Catholics? How do you think that happens? Because we have our opinions. If we just go to God's Word, it would save us a lot of trouble. But then we like to use that, well, this is how I interpret it. It's like, stop. You're not interpreting anything. You're giving me your opinion. I'll interpret God's Word, not what you say about God's Word. That's how we do it. Now, so it's available. This light is available to everyone. That's the great gift of Christmas, you guys. It's the gift. All you have to do is ask. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You clearly don't deserve it. None of us, I should say, we don't deserve it. Okay? It's no, no. But it's available. Simply ask. And trust God to do it, to give you the understanding that you need, to show you what he has done for you. Don't worry about whether or not you can understand infralapsarianism versus supralapsarianism. Give me a break. Are you Calvinist or are you an Arminianist? I don't care. I could care less. Well, you need to know because it defines your theology. Based on who? <laughs> on the Calvinist and the Arminianist. If you don't believe like the Calvinist, well, you're an Arminianist. If you're not believe, if you're an Arminianist, you can't believe like the Calvinist because then you're all wrong, right? Everybody's wrong. What did the world do before John Calvin entered the world? 
or Jacob, Joseph, uh, Jacob Arminius. What did the world do? Everybody just wandered around trying to figure it out till these guys showed up. Now, these were great men. I'm not knocking them. They're not the problems. I think if God allowed them to come out of the graves, both of them, they'd stand and they'd walk around smack every one of us. Do you really think when you stand before God, he's going to say, you know what? I was going to let you in, but you became a Calvinist. So I'm not going to let you in. Or vice versa. Oh, well, you were going to come in had you just become a Calvinist. You could have come into eternity with me. Do you really think that that's what God is going to say? Come on. Or a dispensationalist or a covenant. I mean, it goes on and on. Where do all those words come from? Not reading God's word. That's where it comes from. Oh, we study God's word. That's how we can. No, you didn't. You read God's word and you came up with these things and now we're supposed to believe like you or we're all wrong, right? We're the only church where salvation is found. Show me any place in God's word where it says salvation is found in the church. Show me. It's not. Salvation isn't found in the church or any individual except in God himself and what he did through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rest is irrelevant. It's as simple as that. He was in the world. That's the word here. And the world was made through him. There it is, identifying the Logos once again as the creator. And the world was made through him. Notice the next phrase. And the world did not know him. The very one who created this world entered into this world, and the world didn't have a clue who he was. Why? Again, all of the religions, all of the stuff that went along with that. You see, he never fits the, the little picture that we have of what it's supposed to look like. It's ridiculous, but that's what we do. He was in the world, and the world's made through him, and the world did not know him. And then he came to his own. That is to Israel. They should have known this. Why? Because Moses and the prophets had written about it. God had given them his Moedim, his appointed times, his feasts, Passover, Pentecost. It tells you everything that he's going to do. They had it, and they missed it. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Do you know why? He didn't fit their mold. You see, there's, there's a mold that has Baptist at the top. There's a mold that has Methodist. There's a mold that has Roman Catholicism. And, listen to this, there's a mold that has Calvary Chapel. Oh, we're not like that. The heck we ain't. Yes, we are. And if he doesn't fit that mold, well, then he can't really, you know, it just really can't be him. I mean, it's just ridiculous. As I've said before, I think God just sits on his throne and just goes, oh, you hate these people. What else can I do? I've showed them everything. I gave them my word. I gave them my Moedim. I gave them my fixed times. How do they not understand? Never happened to you? Talking to one of your kids? <laughs> right? How can you not understand what I just told you? Marie says this to me all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Funny how all the ladies chuckle there. <laughs> So he came to his own and his home did not receive them. They didn't listen. He didn't fit the mold. He was supposed to come on his white steed with his shiny armor and just go and start wheeling his sword like David did and just wipe out the Romans and just wipe out the Gentiles. Wipe out everybody who stands opposed to Israel because they understood their God, that that's what their God was like. Except that isn't anything that their God was like. Read the Old Testament. They're, they have their version of it as well, by the way. And do you know how many different variations of, of the Jewish religion there is? There's a lot. Don't let them tell you any different. There is. Right? It's just, it's just crazy. There is. There's all these views. And it all comes not from interpretation, which everyone wants you to believe, because that makes it sound theological, and it makes it sound like you know what you're talking. But remember... When they say interpretation, and I'm not talking just them, I'm talking about us as well. When we use the word interpretation, what we're really saying is opinion. Never forget that. If they're not taking it word for word, studying it out word for word, not worried about what anybody wrote before, what anybody's going to write after, and just take it for what it says, then that's interpretation. 
But if you start to manipulate it based on your perspective, you've just turned it into opinion. Okay? So he came to his own, and his own did, did not receive him. Here's this crazy, wonderful verb. I love this verse. But as many as received him. Do you, um, do you see the concept to receive? What are they receiving? The gift. It's offered to all. What we're getting ready to celebrate this week was God's offer that I am entering in and I will take you my long for you. I long for you with everything that is in me to have you in my presence. But this is the way that it must be. You have to trust that there's got to be a sacrificial lamb. Just like Passover told us. That that sacrificial lamb has to be buried. Just like unleavened bread tells us. But that the grave could not hold him, just like Psalm tells us. Just like first fruits told us. And that when this all happens, that I will then equip you with my spirit, which Pentecost. And this will cause you to cry out in joy, Yom Teruah, trumpets. And when all of that happens, then you will understand your sin, and you'll, you'll realize that atonement for what you've done only comes from me on the day of atonement. And when all this is complete, I will come and dwell with you because it's what my heart desires on tabernacles. Whoa. Do you see? As many as received him, those that receive him, to them he gave the right to become theologians. Scholars, mm, priests, popes, pastors, rabbis. I don't see that there. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Whoa. That takes it completely into a different realm. Lord, they said, teach us to pray. They knew all of the prayers for all of the Sabbath, all of the prayers that went with their study of the prophets, all of the prayers that went, that went with their, uh, uh, you know, their synagogue services. We, we could go on and on. They knew all of the prayers for all of the different things. They knew all of those prayers. They knew the Shema. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad. He's one. The two were one. That's what the word means. Adam and Eve. The two were one. That's where it started. They knew all of those prayers. And they said to him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And I'm sure that they were expecting to hear the Shema. But they didn't. Shema, by the way, means to hear. Shema. They didn't. What were the first two words out of Jesus' mouth? Our Father. Whoa, holy smokes. They just asked the Lord and Savior, how do you want us to pray? How do we pray? And he said, Abinu, our Father. Boom. There goes theology. There goes doctrine. Children. He gave them the right to become Children. There's only one true son of God. The rest of us are adopted. And that's a good thing because adoption means that you get to, you pick, you know, how much is that doggy in the window, right? I'm telling you, that's what happens. So, so the idea of adoption, don't be afraid of that. God has wanted it. He's called us to be a part of his family, you guys. So we no longer have to look at him as God. Oh, he is God. Make no mistake about it. But he's father. And then Paul breaks it down even further to where he calls him Abba, right? Which we get daddy from, papa from. It moves from father. Folks, there's a huge difference between a father and a dad. A dog can be a father, right? And sadly, many in our day don't treat their kids any different than a dog does. Well, they may be a father, but it takes the intimacy to become dad. Huge, huge difference. He gave them the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name. 
remember his name, right? This is huge. We're going to see this in just a minute. Who were not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To, be, to get into God's family has nothing to do with anything in the physical realm. Nothing. It simply has to do with belief in what God has done with us, for us, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's our verse. Having stated all of that, you see, oftentimes it's said in the Gospels, in Matthew and Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, we have, these are the Gospels that we use to speak of the birth of Christ. Because clearly they do. Both Matthew and Luke give us great detail about all of the stuff that happened on that day. That's what the kids just played out for us, by the way. Mark doesn't. Mark just jumps right into his gospel. Jesus is already ministering. And it's believed by some that John doesn't as well because he goes right from this into, you know, uh, Acts chapter, or John chapter 2 and stuff, and Jesus is already doing ministry. He doesn't deal with, the, with the, the entrance of Jesus into this world. I would completely beg to differ. Why? Well, look at verse 14. And the word, the logos, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. What kind of glory? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and church. Oh, grace and church. I'm looking at it. <laughs> grace and truth. Okay? Didn't I just talk about being faithful to the text? Okay, but anyway, it says grace and truth, not church. I'm, my brain's ahead of me here. Okay. Now, notice John's gospel doesn't give us the birth of Jesus, doesn't it? What does this verse say? How did he come to dwell among us? He had to be born, didn't he? Of course he did. And by the way, that word there, dwelt, um, uh, was it sene in the Greek, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew sukha, sukkot which means that, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Hmm. Imagine that. What a coincidence. You see, if you're reading this from John's words, as they would have, a Jew writing to Jews at this point in time, the church hadn't expanded yet. Well, it had, it just it hadn't taken root yet in Europe. So it was still in the Middle East. This is exactly how they would have understood this passage. Because they understood to dwell means tabernacle. Remember what we said? God dwelling with us. So when the word became flesh and the logo became flesh and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and not church, truth. Okay. Now, as I was reading and studying this, you know, I read a lot, and, and because I'm in this stuff, I, I really enjoy, I know I've shared this with you guys, but I really enjoy reading Messianic Jews. In other words, Jews that have come to receive Jesus as their Messiah. Because their perspective on it is unbelievable, because they grew up, like you and I, in Sunday school class, learning Moses, learning the prophets. They know these holy days, the, the fixed times. They know all those. So I found a guy, one of the ones I was reading, and this is how he interpreted it. The Word became a human being and tabernacled with us, notice, and we saw his Shekinah, the Shekinah of the Father's only Son in absolute grace and truth. Whoa! Why is that important? Because if you're a Jew, this is what you heard John say. Why is this so significant? What the heck is Shekinah? Shekinah was the, the presence, the, the, the dwelling of God and his appearing amongst his people. That's called the Shekinah glory. If you ever see a picture of the tabernacle and read in Exodus as God moved his people from Egypt into the promised land, you see that there was a, 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 a cloud of, uh, of smoke in the daytime that was over them as they walked. That's called the Shekinah glory, God's presence amongst his people. And at nighttime, it was a pillar of fire. God was constantly with his people as he moved them through. 
In fact, he had them set up the mishpachan, the, the, uh, the tabernacle, the place where he would literally physically meet with them as his glory would settle over the mercy seat in the tabernacle. The very place where he said it's there on the seat of mercy covering the rejection of Israel and the rejection of God's leadership of Aaron with Moses, Aaron's staff laying there. The rejection of God's provision and having the, the bowls of manna inside the, car, the, the ark. And then the rejection of God's law with the two tablets in the ark. All in the ark. Covered by the mercy seat. Everything that they did opposed to God is covered by mercy. Sound familiar? And it's there, God said, on the mercy seat, between the two cherubim, the cherubim, it's there that I will meet you. I will meet you at the place of mercy where all your sin is covered. Atonement. Kafaret. The idea of covering one's mouth and withholding judgment. That's what the mercy seat was called. God said, there, I will meet you with it. That's where his presence in the cloud, the Shekinah, when he called Moses up onto the mountain to give them him Torah, what we call the Ten Commandments, his ten instructions, his ten teachings. They were not law. They were instructions and they were teachings. And he called Moses up. What was on top of the mountain that Moses went into? The cloud. God's glory. God's Shekinah. His presence amongst his people. So now, if you're a Jew, and he's saying this to you, and hopefully you'll see this today, the word became a human being and tabernacled with us. He made his dwelling amongst us. And because he made his dwelling amongst us, we saw his Shekinah. What kind of Shekinah? The Shekinah that only the Father's Son can have. The kind that is absolute grace and truth. Whoa. John 1.14, pretty powerful verse about the entry of our Savior into this world. Wouldn't you say? But we're told that the birth of Jesus isn't in John chapter 1. Really? Now, of these feasts that we talked about on Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, uh, uh, God required uh, his people to come into his presence. Passover in the spring, Pentecost in the summer, and Tabernacles. These were called pilgrim feasts, okay? This was where the people were all required under Torah, under God's instructions, that they all had to go to Jerusalem. The first was in the spring, as I said, at Passover. The second in the summer, which was Pentecost. Actually, that A should be an E. Wow, I totally messed up. And then the third is in the fall tabernacles. Now, what's significant about this is that in those days, Jerusalem, of course, was the major city of that time. So for people to come in there, the, the city is going to swell like Vegas on New Year's Eve unless it's 2020, okay? So, but I mean, it just, well, everybody's coming. It would just, the people would multiply, okay? Now, the thing about tabernacles was it happened in September to October at the end of the harvest season, okay? So all of the harvest, it had been planted, it had been picked, it had plucked, it had been sold in the markets, it was out there. It was at this time that we read in Luke, as the kids just told us in their story in the second chapter, it was during this period of time that the census was given. You see, Rome, the Romans were not dumb. If we're going to take a census of the people in what we now call the Middle East, then the best time for us to do that, to get money from them, since it's about taxes ultimately, is to do it at the end of the harvest season. We don't want to interrupt this because it's the harvest that pays the taxes, okay? And just lucky for us, it happens to be at that time that people are coming from all over the Roman Empire to Jerusalem. Why is that important? Because when we get down to verse 7 of Luke chapter 2, which we saw again, 
And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. In other words, she mummified him. I don't know if you guys know that or not. That's what they did. They were afraid of crooked legs and hands, so they would literally wrap them like this. Oh, geez, that would drive me crazy. The equivalent, put a kid in a car seat. <laughs> it's torture. Love every minute of it. Anyway, um, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger. A manger. Clever little manger made back here. What is a manger? A feed trough. That's what it is. Why did this happen? Well, because there was no room in the inn. We always talk about this. Did you ever ask yourself, why was there no room in the inn? Oh, well, the Romans said, we're going to use Sukkot, the celebration of tabernacles at the end, by the way, how lucky we are. We're going to use that when everybody's coming into this area's and we're going to use that time to do this. The inn was over full because everybody was on their way, coming from their cities, where they, like Bethlehem, on their way to Jerusalem for tabernacles, which is exactly what they were required to do. This is why the inn was too full to take them when they got there. So what do Mary and Joseph do? Well, tradition tells us or, or understanding of this, again, before we changed it, do you know what Mary and Joseph did because there was no room? And they had probably brought at least some of the materials with them. They made a sukkah. What's a sukkah? A tabernacle. Like they had done every year throughout their lives. At this point, as she's carrying Jesus Christ in her womb, they made a sukkah. This is what they looked like. This is a traditional sukkah. They're very simple, you guys. They had to be three sides. One side had to be open. The top could be covered, but it had to be clear enough that you could see stars through it. So that's what you're seeing there. It's like, well, gee, they could have put a better roof on the thing, right? So that's, this is what it looked like. Now, stop and think about this with Christmas. What does this look like to you? Hmm, I don't know. What about that? Oh. So Mary and Joseph can't get into the sukkah because Rome has asked everybody to go to their homeland as they're on their way to Jerusalem because Rome is smart and knows that people are going to come from, you know, today, modern-day Greece and, and Syria and all of those places. They all got to come to Jerusalem, you guys. Why? It's tabernacles. They're required to do it. Ah, we're going to take advantage of this. You see? You see what's happening? This is why there was no room at the inn. I believe this, is, this so supports this. And I'm telling you, I've done this for, you know, almost 40 years now. And, I, and myself, including, I never hear anybody talk about why the inn was full. It just, it's just, well, it was full. Some say, well, it was the census. Okay, well, but, but people went, they had to go to their hometowns. So they wouldn't have all had to go to Jerusalem, right? Or in that area. Do you understand Bethlehem and Jerusalem are very close? They would have went to, those from Nazareth would have had to go to Nazareth. Those from Caesarea would have had to go to Caesarea. Those from Antiochus, uh, 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 Pisidia, up in Syria. That's their home. That's where their Paul was from there. Paul was from Damascus. Paul would have had to go to Damascus. Do you see? So what is it? Why was it so crowded there? I mean, this is Jerusalem. It's the biggest city of the day, but it wasn't Vegas, you guys. In fact, it, it, it did, it, you know, except on these holidays, it was normal population, but it would swell. There was no room at the end because it was tabernacles. Exactly what John tells us in his first chapter. So when we think about these things, we need to understand them from God's perspective. Because all of a sudden, it makes sense. We no longer have to worry about this and all of the stuff. And we, rel we recognize the tradition. We don't worry about it. Now, some people will completely rebel against this and say, well, that's just not true and I'm not going to believe it. Others will say, oh, I believe that's true, so I'm not celebrating on Christmas on December. So stop. Just stop. Don't be a dork. Okay? You understand what December 25th is about? It's about God entering our feet. It's about tabernacles. Celebrate tabernacles on the 25th. You ain't Jewish. It'll be okay. Relax. 
We don't need to panic over this stuff. But that doesn't mean that we can't get clarity on it. So what we celebrate in December actually would have taken place on Tabernacles in September because it had begun nine months earlier in, um, the, the, uh, in Kislev when, when on, on Hanukkah. I mean, it's, it all just falls together when you get this. It's just like we say, we're, we got Easter coming up here shortly, right? I and mean, everybody believes that, um, that, that, you know, Good Friday was on Friday. No, it wasn't. There wasn't such thing as Good Friday. That came in later. It was Good Thursday. We know that because of God's holy days, because of God's appointed times. Can't argue with that. Who cares what tradition teaches? That's what God said. We'll get into that when it's Easter time. So, We've read this, we looked at this last week, but we need to see this again. Because this is on many of your Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Oh, the child is going to be the Everlasting Father. Ooh, right? He'll also be called the Prince of Peace. I looked at, we looked at this last week, but I want to remind you again, never forget this. You have everything in this passage. For unto us, a child is born. You have Passover. Okay? You have, oh, oops, and then a son is given. Uh, you have, I'm, uh, a child is born. You have tabernacles. Son is given. You have Passover. Okay? What do you have in those two statements? You have Christmas and you have Easter. In one verse. Well, you can't, teach, you can't teach the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament, Rick. I didn't. Isaiah did. Right? And then you even have tabernacles, which I missed, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When? In his kingdom. What is his kingdom called? Tabernacles. Because he'll be here dwelling amongst his people. In one verse. One verse. Tells us everything that we need to know. Amen? It's just amazing stuff. And then the last day of the grief feast, we talked about this when we were looking at tabernacles. I'm going to go through this quickly. Remember, it was eight days and there was an eighth day. And on that day, they would do all this stuff with water and all of this stuff. And it was on that day. This is tabernacles, by the way. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. On tabernacles. Right? I'm here to dwell amongst you. If you need the source of life, I am it. Just come to me. And then you read in the Old Testament, in the, in, again, in Isaiah, just a couple of chapters later, talking about this same period of time. Therefore, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. That sounds awesome, doesn't it? Anybody know what the word salvation in Hebrew is? Whoops, sorry. One click. Whoop. <laughs> I forgot I did that. With joy. Here's the Hebrew translated to English. With joy you will draw water from the source of Yeshua. What was Jesus' name? It wasn't Jesus. It was Yeshua. That's what his name was. Whoa. So when he stood that day, they knew who he was, Yeshua. They would not have called him Jesus. They knew who he was, Yeshua. They knew what his name meant. And they knew that when he cried out there in the midst of all of the chaos, and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. They know he is speaking Isaiah to them. They knew. We don't. Because we got our own theology. Or so we think. Pretty amazing stuff when you stop and think about it, right? Merry Christmas, you guys. You have a great week. Watch this. I love this. Yeshua, salvation, Jesus, is the reason for the season. Happy Feast of Tabernacles. Amen? Amen. Remember God came to dwell amongst us Thursday evening and into Friday. That's what it's all about. Why? To bring us light. And by bringing us light, he brings us life. And he invites us into his family where we too could call God Father, Dad, 
Papa. We could go on and on. You get the idea. That's what Christmas is all about. It's all found in Sukkot Tabernacles because it's where Yeshua, who is the source of all life, entered into our realm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and for your word. These simple things, Lord, that we just, it's just hard to imagine why we just ignored these things for literally centuries. And yet they're there so clear because we always allow our own thoughts to get in the way, our own perspectives. But when we take you at your word, because that's exactly what it is, we find everything that we need. Lord, we know from the book of Nehemiah that tabernacles stopped being celebrated in the days of Joshua until the days of Ezra the priest, all through judges, all through the kings, all through the Babylonian captivity. It's when the Jews were returning back from Babylon to Jerusalem that they discover your word. The first time. And when they discover your word, Ezra reads the passage of tabernacles. And the people we read wept with joy because they had forgotten. It's not until, Lord, your word is presented that your people could once again understand that you desire to dwell amongst them. Very little changed, Lord, until Jesus entered the picture. And Lord, we long for the day when he comes back because Yeshua, our salvation, is the reason for the season. And that's what Tabernacles is all about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.